there's certainly something strange happening. Um, five years ago, TED was something that was enjoyed by a thousand people once a year. And um, uh, today, it's something enjoyed by about 300,000 people every day. Um, and Taylor mentioned, you know, more than 100 million uh, TED Talks have been viewed. When you think about that, I mean, it's, it is strange, you know, 100 million lectures viewed on the internet, you know, who would have thought? How did it happen? Um, this event here today actually seems equally miraculous to me. Uh, TED itself had really nothing to do with organizing it, and trust me, organizing an event like this takes a huge amount of effort. And yet, um, it's one of um, more than 100 that will be held this year around the world as part of this TEDx program of independently organized uh, TED events. And, and the program's still in, in beta. It hasn't really even started yet. No one's making any money. This is being done for passion, uh, curiosity. You know, how did that happen? So I should warn you that the, that the story I will tell is not, it's not like a top-down plan of you know, some determination to propagate TED to the world. Um, I think you'll discover that TED is, is, has a life of its own. It's more mysterious than that. Um, it's a story of a very strange but I think beautiful cultural phenomenon that has emerged out of uh, a really remarkable community, which by the way uh, includes you. Um, so, TED past, present, and future. Um, TED started as an experiment in convergence. Uh, the brilliant Richard Werman and Harry Marks figured out 25 years ago that the industries of technology, entertainment, and design uh, were converging. That the, the, If you brought together the people from those three worlds, they would have interesting things to say to each other. And so it turned out the first TED, held in 1984, showcased the brand new Apple Macintosh. Um, and Sony showed off these strange, uh, shiny, silver round discs containing digital sound, which were the first CDs. And you know, both objects, if you like, oozing uh, technology, entertainment, and design. Um, and people were wowed. Uh, the event lost money and uh, wasn't held again for, for another six years. But uh, after that, <laughs> after that, it's been held annually. Uh, it really, really took off. Um, and a strange thing started to happen. The content broadened. In addition to the T, E, and D of TED, you know, in came storytellers, uh, adventurers, entrepreneurs, business leaders, just ordinary human beings with a, with a surprising story to tell. And Remarkably, instead of the audience going, oh, this is diluted, this is, this is losing relevance to me, they loved it. Why? Why? Well, it turns out that a lot of us forgot somewhere along the line that actually all of knowledge is connected. And when you hear someone remarkable, whoever they are, um, share something of their passion, of what they do, not only are you inspired by them personally, but you, you start to see connections that you didn't see before between what you do and what they do and between what they do and what someone else does. So we spend our lives digging these trenches. Um, that's, you know, we get really good at one thing, and that's where we live. That's where we're, we're focused. Um, TED is the moment where you come out of your trench and you ascend up a slope, and you see how what you do connects with what everyone else does. And it can be really eye-opening and, and, and thrilling, and it can fill you with a new sense of, of possibility. So in, um, let's see, 11 years ago, I was certainly digging my own trench. You know, I was trying to build this technology publishing company, magazines, websites. Um, and I was in it deep. And this was the year that I, I first went to TED. Um, I was smitten. Um, you know, I'd always thought of myself as, as this slightly, you know, odd man out. Like, I, I always struggled to make conversation about house and garden and family gossip and movies and celebrity and all the things that I, I, I think normal people talk about, do they? Um, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. That's a great comment. Um, <clears throat> um, 
At, at TED, I found myself surrounded by this motley crew of, of geeks, uh, uh, sort of passionate entrepreneurs, inventors, creatives. Really, they didn't have a whole lot in common, except that they were all really curious. They were all absolutely eager and willing to talk out-of-the-box ideas and to engage in conversations that, depending on your viewpoint, were either a little bit crazy or might turn out to be really important. Uh, I loved it. I, I thought I'd come home. And the media entrepreneur in me noticed something as well. Um, so in media, we're obsessed with this. Attention is our currency. Um, and we measure it in, in lots of different ways. We measure you know, eyeballs. Um, how many are there? Ratings, circulation, and so forth. We also look at demographics. Who, who owns those eyeballs? Um, Bill Gates is worth more than Billy Bloggs. Um, and um, there's a third measure of attention, though, that is much harder to measure. And, uh, and so we don't often talk about it. We should, because it's the most important of the three. It's the measure of the quality of attention. Um, is it focused or casual? Is there indifference or is there passion? You know, passion is the, is the measure of uh, a media business uh, that has value for the, for the long term. You can get away with selling ads for a while, for example, to large numbers of casual people, but they probably won't renew. Passion is how you build a community, how something takes on a life of its own. And what I, what I saw at TED was not only were the 800 people there you know, really influential people, but they had a level of attention that was way off the charts. I mean, they were there for four days. They were focused. They were engaged. And they used words like, this is the highlight of my year. I mean, this was a media thing that just exhibited extraordinary passion. And so I, you know, thought, it, you know, Ted is amazing. And I also thought, wow, it's, it's, it's an incredibly potent media asset, if you like, in, in the making. I mean, there's something really, really amazing here. And so I started to dream about whether there might be some way, you know, I could play a bigger role. And, um, you know, to cut a long and complicated and occasionally painful journey short, 2001, um, a foundation that, that I'd set up found itself as the, the proud owner of TED. And I got to run it. And uh, I was terrified. Um, first of all, the business I'd been building had been smacked hard by the dot-com bust. Um, I'd had to lay off a 1,000 people, half the workforce. Um, I knew that it was time for me to, to leave. I felt like an abject failure. And I knew that if I failed at TED as well, there would be nowhere to hide. Um, it also didn't help that I knew nothing about the conference business um, or that um, <laughs> I, had, I had none of uh, Richard Werman, who was now the solo, or had been the solo owner, uh, had nothing of his huge stage presence. Um, <clears throat> and so the goal number one was <clears throat> don't screw it up. <laughs> and uh, I, worked really hard to figure out what, what, was, what was it about TED that was so special. You know, don't touch that, only tweaks. Some of the early tweaks included professionalizing the logistics of, of TED, courtesy of these two amazing Canadian twins, the McCartney sisters, who put on events with, a, with a attention to detail that uh, uh, I hadn't seen before. And then as far as you know, the program was concerned, it was just continue this process, make it continue the process of broadening it out, you know, bring in more people, we brought in more scientists, um, more out-of-the-box thinkers, more non-Americans, more women. Um, and um, several core members of the TED community um, during what was a two-year transition uh, process, you know, really got behind it. Uh, Jeff Bezos and John Doerr and Sonny Bates and Linda Stone and Sergey Brin and Larry Page and, you know, and actually some people in this room who uh, I won't embarrass, but, but thank you. Um, um, and really uh, swung, swung the community around to believing that TED could, could go on. And so the first, uh, you know, the first event did um, pretty much sell out ahead of, well ahead of time. And uh, as, as it drew nearer, 2003, um, 
there was one other thing that I, I felt like really needed to happen. You know, I, I felt like this sense of inspiration and possibility that always hit people at TED. That we just we needed to do something with that. You know, there, there was so much potential there to make a difference in the real world. You know, what could we do? And so, at the end of um, um, TED 2003, you know, I urged the audience to consider getting behind some of these big world causes like AIDS or you know, fresh water, you know, the oceans crisis. And some people loved it and some really didn't. I mean, the truth is, um, one person's cause is another person's, dear God, please shoot me now. Um, I mean, it is. And you, in, a, in a conference filled on helping people rediscover wonder and a sense of possibility, curiosity, you have to be really careful what, what you kind of do that might be perceived as cramming something down someone's throat. Um, so um, uh, a few long-standing members of the tech community were thoroughly pissed off and actually left, and I thought I might have blown it. Um, however, that little kerfuffle led to something very special. A group of us went away for a weekend, and we brainstormed about, look, there's got to be a way to do this. This stuff really matters. It's actually inherently quite interesting. How do we bring it to TED in a more TED-like way? And what that led to was this. So every year we bring three remarkable people to TED, and we give them this, this um, uh, unique proposition. Come and make a wish. Um, tell us your dream. You can make one wish without restriction. And this process has, first of all, allowed us to bring people to TED that we could never have brought. But secondly, it's brought to the conference the world's biggest issues um, in a way that seemed different, magical, exciting, and in a way which led to an extraordinary range of collaborative projects that frankly wouldn't have happened any other way. Bono's um, one.org. Uh, Cameron Sinclair is in the room, actually. TED Prize winner, Cameron. Where are you? There you go. <laughs> this isn't it. Open Architecture Network is an amazing project that brings together the world's designers and architects to collaborate and do stuff that any, anyone could not do. It's a beautiful site that get, gets better every month. We had Pangea Day. We broke, James Nachtway broke this story about TB. The Encyclopedia of Life is being built. That's a massive project that Ted was part of. Um, once upon a school, next Einstein in Africa, and uh, this Charter for Compassion are just, just some of the ones that have, have been done. And so the kerfuffle was over, you know, TED numbers started to grow, and it really started to feel like there was something good going on. And the puzzle was, how could you get these ideas th um, that were exciting people in the conference, could you get them out you know, into the world at large somehow? So if you roll the clock back a bit to when um, I started the foundation that owns TED, I was really obsessed with, with this question. How, how do you make a difference? How, how do you leverage money spent to really have maximum impact? And I thought about these five things, that all of which have massive amplification uh, of human intention. Um, and then it hit me that there was really a bigger thing that encompassed them all. And um, if you focused on that, you know, that, that might be the way to go. I mean, think about ideas. You know, they start off as these little electrical patterns in a in someone's brain, you know, they weigh nothing. Um, but they, in the right circumstances, can spread to another brain. They can excite the body that houses that brain to do stuff. And, and if you're lucky, pass on, you know, the pattern to other people. The ideas do the work for you. That's a really amazing thing. And so we, we wondered how we could let the amazing ideas that happened at TED, which were, after all, the most infectious ideas I've ever seen, boy, if you could see those into the world, what might happen? And how to do it? Um, I hired a woman, June Cohen, to help me figure out the answer to this question. Um, she's an experienced media executive, long-term TEDster. And um, our first shot was television, you know, big audience. We thought TED Talks would look fantastic on TV. Unfortunately, all the TV execs we spoke to didn't see that. Uh, we got nowhere. And so in 2006, we thought we'd do a little experiment and just try putting a few of them up ourselves on the web and see what happened. We were worried that uh, they'd have none of the emotional impact of the live event. We were worried that Tedsters would be annoyed that this stuff was being given away. Um, but so it was just a, an experiment. And Majora Carter and 
Hans Rosling and Ken Robinson, these were, these were three of the first ones we put up. What happened was um, not just that the people passed them on and surprising numbers viewed them, the tone of response we got back astonished us. People laughed, people cried, people were inspired, people told their friends. Um, this word, again, passion, we saw the passion, and that was the clue that there was something bigger here. And so um, we made a decision in 2007 that TED really officially was no longer a conference. Um, TED was going to be this. We engineered the website to be built around spreading free talks to the world. And to our astonishment and delight, the TED community, far from being upset that we were giving away the crown jewels, cheered us on. And it was a thrilling thing to see. So where is this going? I mean, in 2009, you know, we've seen the continuation of this process of just letting TED go free to the world. We had this open translation project, which has been thrilling, seeing literally hundreds of translators take TED and bring those talks to their own communities. And now this TEDx program, um, spreading the live events to the world. Um, where's it heading? Well, the truth is, uh, I don't know. I think it's an incredible fact, an incredible discovery, really, that millions of people around the world are, want knowledge. You know, they want this rediscovery of wonder. Um, they want the sense of possibility. And they, they actually want to be part of shaping the future. That's a surprise, and that's, and that's thrilling in its, in its own right. Um, but um, even more thrilling is this, you know, TED is part of a much bigger revolution in, I'd say, global education that's, that's made possible by the web. It's an amazing fact that people like this can become a new type of global icon, that the role of teacher in our world is about to become sexy, wonderful. You know, I mean, it, it should have always been, right, but it hasn't been the last few years. Teachers can reach people across the world. That is amazing. And when I, if you asked what my dream was, I think the best way I would answer it would be to look at this picture here. You know, these are kids photographed in a village in Pakistan, not far from where I was born. Um, their parents would have been born about the same time as me. Unlike me, you know, I had an education and got to lead an amazing life. They didn't have that chance. They lived a life grinding out a living in tough conditions. Their beautiful children um, may have a different chance. You know, in five years' time, each of these kids will probably have access to a cell phone that will be more com powerful than the computer you own. And I would say that you could make the case that the future of the world depends on what they see on that cell phone. You know, will they be looking at trivia, you know, pornography, incitations to violence? Or will some of them get to look face to face at some of the world's greatest teachers, mm -hmm. speaking to them in a language that they can understand and that can give them the information they need to come out of poverty, to realize you know, their true potential. They might be in here. You know, there might be the next Einstein or the next Gandhi, the person who will save the planet for our own grandchildren. How does that happen? I, I can't make that happen. Um, but maybe, just maybe, we can. And certainly today is a really exciting start. So thank you to each of you.